Hello, I am Jesse Weiler here for the Institute on Religious Life with Mother Maria Catherine. Mother, how are you doing today? I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, Mother, you are the General Superior of the Parish Visitors of Mary Immaculate and the Vice Postulator for the Cause of Canonization for your Foundress, Mother Mary Teresa Talon. So that is a lot of information. We're going to cover a lot of great stuff today. But before we get started, as always, would you mind leading us in prayer? Sure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God, our Father, we praise and we thank you for everything. We thank you for the gift of your church, which draws us together and calls us to holiness of life. And today we thank you especially for St. Clair, whose light and fire of love has caused many, many people to come to know Jesus and love him and has affected uh, many, many hearts throughout the world and in the church. We ask her intercession that we too might be filled with that light and that fire of love for you and for your church, for your people, that all that we do and say would be giving you the greatest honor and glory. And we ask this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. St. Clair, pray for us. Pray for us. Of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Mother, for that prayer. And we have a lot to talk about today, uh, but, but mostly as we were discussing before the show started, we were talking about divine providence, and there's so much that goes into that. And before we get into the bulk of that topic, I do want to talk a little bit about the charism of your community and the work that you do, because I think then we can kind of get into this most recent experience that you had in, in Ireland and get into some really great details and stories there. So what is the, the primary charism of your community and how is that lived out? Okay. So, Jesse, our foundress uh, receives her inspiration in 1908 and she gave us a dual uh, charism. We are contemplative missionaries. So as contemplatives, we obviously live a deep life of prayer. And the fruit of that prayer, that love for Christ, that love for God, is what then extends to our missionary postulate of going out to the most rejected and neglected, those persons who are the furthest away from the church. I should say that Mother also explains our vocation as a superior love of God and love of souls. So I haven't gotten there yet, <laughs> superior love of God, I'm working on it. Um, but that's really how she often describes us as women who have that superior love for God and zeal for souls. Um, that's it in a nutshell, but yes, that's our vocation. So how it's really, I'm sorry, no, I was just it's say really the new evangelization lived out. Uh, so we really, um, we're living and, uh, yes, living the new evangelization since our foundation in 1920. Even though those words weren't used, we are evangelists, we are missionaries, we are uh, di missionary disciples, as our Holy Father has called us to be. So, so what does that look like day to day? in the work that you're doing uh, from your community. So we have the contemplative part. So obviously there's a lot of uh, prayer and reflection and all of that. But uh, you also mentioned that you're active, right? So what does that look like on a daily basis? Okay, so of course we make a holy hour of adoration every day. And I know most religious do that. Uh, but when we were founded, that was not uh, the practice. So that really formed, that Eucharistic um, charism really formed our congregation. So we make a holy hour every day. We have Mass, of course, prayers together. And Mother Founders always said the prayer had to be first, and then we go out. So we, we are parish sisters. Our name says Parish Visitors of Mary Immaculate. So a pastor will ask for a sister to work in his parish. And so the sister will make sure, she, first of all, that she does her praying. And then she goes into her apostolate. Either uh, it depends on what the pastor asks of us in the parish. So 
It could be door-to-door -door evangelization, trying to find those persons who are away from the church. Our sisters are also uh, directors of religious education or DRE or CRE, depending on how much, if they've gotten their masters yet, you know. Um, and then that, that plays in, that's their whole life, their day, they'll go into the parish and do whatever the pastor has asked them to do, door-to-door -door visitation, the catechetical ministry, uh, visiting families, especially bringing families together in any way that we can. And Mother said, we have an apostolate that's on the way apostolate. So even when we're going to the parish or like, I'm not in a parish right now, but I mean, if I go to the store or whatever, it's, it's always in your mind uh, and in your heart to find those people who are far away from Christ and the church and to draw them back by our friendliness, you know, and our kindness. Uh, our apostolate is person to person, heart to heart, face to face. So what is it about the parish community or the parish life that is so important uh, for your community expressed, uh, you know, work, active work in? I'm sorry, I'm not understanding the question. So what is it about working at the parish level as, a, you know, supporting the parishes that is so important to the community and the mission? Okay, so um, Mother Founders saw that as the way to reach people in the parish. She really originally wanted to, she thought God was calling her to start a community of sisters who taught in the school. But as time went and as she discerned and prayed she realized that the parish is the heart and uh, so where the heart is there's there's the mother and uh, we are spiritual mothers so it's in the heart of the parish that we reach out and bring families to Christ and also mother had a great love and reverence for the priesthood and so there we are the bridge between the priest and his people we can help him many times the people will give us their confessions, you know. We can't absolve them, but we can send them to the priest. Uh, but people feel comfortable speaking to a sister even more so than the priest. Like we're we're the first we're the first responders, as it were, you know. So another uh, question that I, I have is: you were going over the stuff that you do. I think you glossed over this, but to me, I think this is one of the more profound things: is you mentioned door to door ministry what what yeah. is that and uh, I, just tell me more I'm very interested in that oh sure so in the beginning that's what the sisters did and we do that if what the past wants but door-to-door -door means you knock on every door because what's the goal the goal is to find those people as the Holy Father says who are on the periphery uh, who are not coming to the church. Well, they're not going to come, so we have to find them. And the best way, Mother said, was going to their homes. And so we knock on their door and we say, Hi, I'm Sister So-and-so, and, -so, and uh, I'm from St. Anthony's Parish, and Father Tom would like to get to know his people. Are there any baptized Catholics in your family? And then that they can either slam the door in your face or keep you at the door but talk to you or let you in and you never know what's going to happen but because as part of our charism is really being that friend and that's what we're going to be you know that's what we're going as their friend uh, someone who really cares about their eternal life and it's amazing just amazing how things change um, you know how people will if they don't accept you right away, you know, that friendliness, I'm, I'm not saying that we are always successful, you know, sometimes people don't want to see us, uh, but nine times out of 10, because we are sisters, we go with a habit and that we're recognizable, they, uh, they do open up to us in a way they wouldn't to anyone else. And we do go by, one by one. We don't go in pairs. Uh, we, don't, we go by ourselves to the homes. I, I have to imagine that there are some pretty amazing stories come out of that. Is there is there anyone that comes to mind that you can share uh, or that you were able to be kind of that conduit, that Christ for someone? Yes, I, I, I'll think of one um, it's a while ago because I haven't been in parish work uh, for like 
15 years, you know. But um, when I was novice director, I was training one of the novices in door to door. And here in the parish, we have a trailer park. So we were going trailer to trailer. And uh, we got to this one trailer and met this woman and her husband. But she also had a friend in the trailer with her visiting. So he was had a very nice personality. We chatted, but he was very far away from the church. And we talked. It didn't seem to do much. But anyway, I did my best. We did our best and we left. And this woman was kind of needy. So I would go back every once in a while, a couple of weeks and visit with her. And for a while, I didn't see her friend. And then one of the things we also did in that parish was show up at the soup kitchen and just be there and chat with people so we get to know them and you know draw them back to the church that way. Well, it just so happened that this man was at the soup kitchen one night and I was surprised because he wasn't sitting down eating, but he was working at the soup kitchen. And he said, you know, sister, I was so happy you came to see me. I, I went to confession like you told me. And I spoke to the priest and now I'm going to mass every Sunday. Well, I didn't really, it was so shocking to me because I didn't expect that. I, he really never gave any indication that anything I said went in from here to his heart. Wow. That- so it was very beautiful. That's that's how that is the the mystery of Christ there being able to I mean I see that sometimes with my kids where I'll say something and then it will, I'll see it lived out a couple of days later and like oh they they were listening so um one of the other things that you mentioned uh in this kind of theme is that being a sister seems to break down these barriers for people and they tend to be a little more vulnerable and in this, your ministry has, you know, grown and been successful. And you, you recently came back from a trip to Ireland to see if you can expand and, and grow the community there. Tell me about that trip, uh, what it was like out there, and kind of, you know, what you're preparing to do. Well, you know, I did tell you it was, a, it was an act of God's divine providence because about two years after I was elected the first time, I began to pray and, I mean, I did pray, but, but specifically, I was, I had this sense that parish visitors should be in Europe. We're in Africa, we're in Asia, we're in North America. I said, Europe needs parish visitors. So I began to pray and say, well, Lord, if you want it, it will happen. And I just kept praying and praying. And I, and I kept, every once in a while, I'd say, okay, well, you know, we can't learn another, it's, it's, we have to be in an English-speaking part of Europe, Lord, so, you know, could you please just get it arranged that way? And I kept praying, but nothing, nothing. And then last year, uh, Mother Claire of the CFR sisters um, came back from Ireland. They have sisters there. She came back and called me and said, there's a bishop in Ireland who wants sisters And when he explained to me what he wanted, I said, you want the parish visitors. So I'm going to put you in touch with him, which she did. And we chatted and I said, Bishop, I don't have sisters to send to Ireland. Um, If we do come, it would have to be on a very temporary basis. But I cannot promise you anyone now. And he said, okay, well, we'll just keep praying for God's time. I went, so, but I started praying to St. Patrick, which I never did. And then I went home, it was in the summer, I went on a home visit. When I came back, there was a letter and I knew it was from Ireland. I said, oh, Bishop's sending me a letter. I picked up, oh, this is not from the Bishop, this is someone else. And I opened it and it was the Archbishop of Armagh who was writing to ask me for sisters. Well, at that point, I did not know that the Archbishop of Armagh was, I didn't know Armagh was St. Patrick's seat. So I called a priest friend of ours, Father Fred Miller, and I said, no, you won't believe in this. And he's like, Mother, do you know that that's St. Patrick's seat? I said, no, no, St. Patrick is answering my prayer. So I got in touch with the Archbishop, and we set up a Zoom meeting, and he asked one of his priests to keep in touch with me. And I told him the same thing, Bishop, you know, we don't have sisters to send, but, you know, maybe in the future, somehow we can do something. But you know, um, Jesse, 
time went and we kept, Father and I kept praying and all of a sudden it was like I had four sisters free that I would be able to send. Two, I had to get them released from their parish work and one was a junior sister who had just completed a parish and another is a sister who's here at the mother house and she's uh, a, she's a counselor. So, oh my goodness, I don't believe it. So it which it just worked and now so this is we went over we did i said okay we can do a temporary mission for three months the sisters are there we went there in july and they'll be there till october october 7th and the first couple of weeks while i was there we were just settling in and getting to know people but first of all jesse the people's faith i, I always thought that Ireland, the people in Ireland were really losing their faith, and maybe that's true, but there are so many people who go to daily mass that I was in awe, and they were so thrilled to see sisters, and now the sisters are telling me, so we did a little bit of apostolic work, not much while I was there because we were just getting adjusted and, you know, meeting people, but now the sisters are in two dioceses. Two of them are in Armagh and two are in County Meath. And the ones in County Meath said, it, now they have to leave 10 minutes earlier to get to church or five minutes earlier to get to the church, which is a 10 minute walk, but it takes them longer because as they're walking, people are always stopping them, asking them questions about the church. And they've met people who were very far away from the church that are coming back uh, they're meeting young women who are interested in religious life. Um, and the, the Archbishop had told me that there were vocations in Ireland, but they didn't have solid communities to go to. So that's one reason why he wanted us to get well known there as well, so that the girls would have an opportunity to have a religious community to go to that is really living authentic religious life. Um, they we're teaching the, the Legion of Mary mm -hmm. how to do door-to-door -door evangelization. And there's a close connection between us and the Legion because we were founded in 1920. They were founded in 1921, but with the same, through the power of the same Holy Spirit to go into the homes, to find those people and bring them back to Christ. So uh, the sisters are doing an amazing ministry there in Ireland right now. I don't think they're going to want to come home, but um, they have to. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they, we did partner. We are partnering with the CFR sisters who are there. Um, let the, the second week we were there, they, the two of our sisters, the young ones, did a youth uh, summer camp with the CFR sisters. And now they're on a Youth 2000 uh, in County Kildare, which begins today and will end on uh, Sunday. So they're there with the sisters as well. Uh, and their Youth 2000 is for 25 years and older. So maybe we'll get some vocations from that one. Let's, let's hope so. Let's hope that that's uh, divine providence. I, I want to get into a little bit of the theology now. And we talked about this uh, again on the phone. But I think people have a misunderstanding about what divine providence is as opposed to something like the prosperity gospel or, you know, the, the other, you know, extreme, which is like this vague spiritualness. And if I will good, if I do, if I put good into the world, I will get good back, you know, things like that. So can you maybe put that in a nutshell? Like what is divine providence as opposed to some of these other, you know, false claims or false things that we hear in our world today? Mm -hmm. Well, let's, I'll say divine providence first, because I have to tell you, when, when you mentioned that to me, I was saying, you know, I know I've heard people say I'm spiritual but not religious. I don't really know what that means, but uh, I kind of know what it means. But anyway, I was, I was uh, quizzing some of our staff, and I said, okay, tell me, what do you, when I say to you what, I'm spiritual but I'm not, I'm not religious, what does that mean to you? And um, one of them said, well, I don't, you know, I just do what I want. I said, oh, okay. And the other one said, well, you know, I, I know someone who uh, says they, they, they believe in the Ten Commandments, they believe in God, but they don't believe in organized religion. I said, oh, okay, that's, that's what I kind of wondered if that's really what it meant. But anyway, for me, 
divine providence is it's that trust and that hope that God's will uh, is the best and we depend on him God has his plan and we depend on God's plan uh, it's not my will it's God's will as Jesus said not what I will but what you will father and then we go ahead and I mean, it takes a lot of prayer, <laughs> you know, it takes prayer and real uh, trust that, um, so for example, let's take this uh, Ireland thing. Did I, I mean, how did I know it was really God's will? I didn't, I, I mean, I felt in my heart that God wanted this, but it could have been just my idea. But as time went, as circumstances un, uh, unfolded, it was coming to, I was coming to see and believe that it was God's will and God was providing uh, for his will to take action, to take, to, to come together and to be done, to be fructified and moved ahead. Uh, you know, it's not a vague something out in the sky that, well, yes, you know, I'll go in the woods and pray and, you know, yes, I, I do believe God is there somehow and uh, just do my own thing as that woman, one of our staff members said, do my own thing. Um, that's not divine providence. That's not even trust. That's not even living a Christian life. Uh, you know, uh, To me, divine providence is God's will in my life. Uh, he shows me in different ways, but I have to be open. It takes a lot of discernment and listening and, and, and consulting. You know, I have to tell you, the day that the council was going to decide whether we should go to Ireland or not. I was at the computer before the meeting. And you know how on your computer screen, when you open it up, there are pictures that come up and say, do you like this? There was a beautiful picture that came up. I said, oh my gosh, I wonder where that scene is from. And I clicked on it and it said, Connemara, Ireland. I said, that's it. I'm sure this is God showing us we're going to Ireland. <laughs> Uh, but divine providence is really, it's depending on God to answer, depending on God to show you, but not going ahead of him, waiting. It's waiting for him to provide the means to do what you believe he's asking you to do. What about our perspective? Because, you know, we can get myopic and selfish with this, right? You know, if what I want is we believe is a good thing, right? Let's say I, you know, I want to I want to be married, and that's a good thing, and I want to be a good husband. But um, you know, for whatever reason, I'm having difficulty dating or what all, all that type of stuff, and it's not happening. And there's a struggle there, and my will is not lining with God's will. How do we, how do we sort that out? Because it's not just about what we want, even if it's a good thing. How do we deal with that? Well, I guess I would have to say the first thing that came to my mind when you were asking that question was, I, you know, to have someone that you trust to speak with. So a priest or a religious, you know, there's a spiritual, that's spiritual direction too, to help so, to have someone to help you to discern God's will. And it's that whole, that whole process of discernment which is very, very important. Um, I remember one time in preparing for a chapter some years ago, I found this book on discernment. I began reading it. And at, by that, at that point in my life, I always thought discernment meant, well, you sit and you pray. If you think this is God's will, so you sit and pray, and God will show you. Uh, but it, and you only do it at a certain time. You know, and then every other, you know, all the other days that you live, it's, you, know, you live another way. Well, when I read this book, I realized discernment is an everyday thing. You live every day in discerning. What is God asking of me today? You know, so our particular examination of conscience, our general examination of conscience at night before we go to bed. What was God saying to me through the day? What did God say to me in the scriptures that I read during my prayer time or in this person that I met? What was God revealing to me? in that uh, encounter. So that discernment, we have to learn to live a daily life of discernment. And then that will help us, again, with a spiritual director too, you know, to help us to sort out uh, what's my own self-centered wants and 
things that I think God wants, what does God objectively really asking of me? So uh, what about this business about the prosperity gospel? Because I think this is something that's really incredible too, and it can seep its way into our hearts as well. If if I'm doing good and I'm, you know, doing all the things and I'm really, I'm really humble, (laughs) thinking about how humble I am, (laughs) and, uh, you know, I'm donating, I'm praying regularly and all this type of stuff, and then I expect to be rewarded from that, you know, knowing all the things I sacrificed, of course, I'm going to get things in return, right? That's kind of how how we understand sacrifice. You sacrifice ourselves uh, on the altar at mass, and then we get ourselves returned back perfectly through Christ, right? So we're kind of used to this. How do we sort that out? Because that can lead us down a bad path as well. Yes. You know, it comes to my mind lately, we've been hearing in the scriptures um, uh, yesterday, I think it was yesterday uh, in the reading at Mass, the Gospel, Jesus said, uh, unless you put the seed, this is not exactly his word, you know, but the seed has to die before it grows, and then uh, whoever wants to uh, live his life must lose his life. You know? Um, so Jesus himself is our example. Um, he, he was good. He was loving. He was compassionate. But look what happened to him. He had enemies. Uh, there was no prosperity in the cross. There was no prosperity in his life of poverty. Um, he had nowhere to lay his head. But he did his Father's will. So our goal is to do the Father's will. And we live the commandments. We live um, the Beatitudes. We live them out in our lives. Uh, that doesn't mean that we're so wonderful. I was just now just came to my mind, you know, the Pharisee and the publican. Oh, look, Lord, at what I do. I tithe. I do this. I do that. How wonderful I am. And there in the background is the poor guy saying, oh, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Um, that's the stance that that really gives us prosperity. You know, the stance of the humble person who recognizes who they are and what they are in the light of God's love um, and lives that way, not expecting anything from God, but giving everything. I think uh, that to me, that's it. The prosperity is to give everything, you know, to give everything to God. And what he gives us back is his love. And we see that in the life of Christ. But but Jesus is, Jesus, his life is, is what leads us, not, um, you know, what I'm going to get out of it. And I think that's part of the problem today. Mm-hmm. We want, we want, you know, what mm-hmm. am I going to get out of this? It's not what I'm going to get out of it. It's what am I putting yeah. into my life? And of course, that's a difficult thing. I mean, it's easier said than done, right? You know what I mean? Like maybe in your heart, you wanted to expand to Ireland. Like that was your desire and you were, things were popping up because you were thinking about it and that's what you wanted. And so those that's what those connections are. And so discerning those can be very difficult sometimes. And so I'm really glad that you talked about having a third party involved to say like, because I think that helps us understand if what we're doing is balanced or not. And uh, that can be really mm-hmm. reassuring. Mother, if people are interested in checking out your community and joining so that you can expand further into Europe, uh, where, can, where can they go yeah. to find out more information about your community? Okay, we do have a website, and the website is parishvisitorsisters.org. Uh, we do have a Facebook page. Um, you know, we're not the greatest that, uh, you know, we have one sister who takes care of it, but, you know, we are a small community, so we don't always get to get it updated all the time, but it's there. Um, and on our website, there is a video that we made to celebrate our 100th anniversary which was two years ago. Now we're going to be 102 on Monday. I I just wanted to say this, too, about discernment. I did say that um, to have a third party, and for me, because you were saying, you know, I could have thought all those wonderful things and they were just coming from me. But uh, also what we have as part of our way of life is the general superior doesn't make her especially... uh, uh, decisions like that without a council. So there are four other women who are with me in the administration. And anything like that, you know, they give their, they go to prayer as well. And they 
discern as well, and then we come together and discern together. So that's how uh, we can. That's how we discern uh, God's will for us. Well, I think I need to get a counsel for my life, probably. <laughs> <laughs> If only, if only it were that easy. But, but all the more reason to you know have brothers and sisters in community prayer and and to to and to be honest, you know what's going on in your life? Can you offer this for me? Can you help me with, uh, figure out what's going on? So, uh, mother, this was such an amazing conversation. Uh, Are we finished? I I told you it's thirty <laughs> minutes long. Feels like five. That's what I told you on the phone yesterday, and now you're living it right now. Uh, but uh, it's probably God's uh, divine providence that this is only 30 minutes because uh, we, we could probably go on for hours or days at uh, this conversation. But uh, thank you so much for your wonderful conversation. You know, we had you on a year ago. We said we got to get you back. So this has been great. That's why we didn't talk about your vocation story because if somebody wants to hear that, they can uh, go back in our, our video catalog and, and hear all of that. Um, we really wanted to focus on what's going on with the community right now. So thank you so much you. for your thank dedication you so and commitment and openness and humility to, to God's providence. And uh, thank you for, for joining us. Thank you for asking, Jesse. You're in my prayers, and so is the Institute on Religious Life. Great, great. Okay, thank you, and God bless. Thank you. God bless you.